Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a very special collaboration between the USC School of Cinematic Arts, USC Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative, and LA Skins Fest. And tonight's panel discussion is about Native American women in media. Uh, we'll be talking with Native American female writers, actors, and filmmakers to discuss their careers, challenges, and how they've overcome. Uh, tonight's panel discussion will be moderated by Alyssa London. And before we get started, I'd like to invite Kara Jade Myers to offer a land acknowledgement. Hello, everyone. Yes, I was nominated to do this, so here we go. <laughs> All right, so I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tonga people. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kara. And uh, I'd, I'd now like to invite uh, Patricia Gomez to talk about LA Skins Fest. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Women in Media panel. My name is Patricia Gomez, just like you know, Alex said. I'm festival director of the LA Skins Fest. And I just want to take a moment to thank the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts and Vision and Voices for partnering with our festival and having this monthly series going on. Uh, we have another one coming up in October, October 10th, I believe, on People's Indigenous Day. So definitely mark your calendar for that. And um, my, in a final little short announcement that I have, um, we have our unscripted workshop um, program taking applications. Um, the final deadline for that is tomorrow. So if you're a filmmaker, um, if emerging artist, a producer, or you know you just want to explore the the arena of documentary, I highly encourage you to apply for this program. You can visit nama.media and learn more about that program. Again, it's NAMA.media. And um, I just wanna just send it over to Alyssa, our moderator, and she, you know, take it over. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, so like Patricia said, this is the Native Women in Media panel, and it's a discussion meant to provide genuine feedback from Native American women writers, filmmakers, and actors regarding the current state of representation in media. Um, I'm currently the host of uh, Native American Calling um, morning show, and I think that's why I get to be the moderator here today. Um, but I want to give our esteemed panelists all an opportunity to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with Princess because she's also here in Alaska. Stephen Peter Ojigavakwa. Uh, my name is Princess Dajrai Johnson, and I'm Netsaiguichin and Ashkenazi Jewish on my father's side. And my grandparents come from um, Arctic Village, Alaska, and they're the late Stephen and um, Catherine Peter. And I live here in Trothit or Fairbanks, Alaska. So I'm right in the interior of Alaska. And I'm just really honored to share this space with you all. Merci. Thank you. And because I just finished watching her show that she just directed, Tazba. <laughs> I like the logic to the introductions. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tazba Rose Chavez. I am a citizen of Bishop Paiute tribe from the Diné, Numu, and San Carlos Apache people. Um, I come from the place of flowing water, which is where I am now in Bishop, California, which is about like four hours northeast of LA and also where y'all get your water. So you're welcome. Thank you. And <laughs> because she has Northwest Coast form line in her screen right now as a piece of art in the lower <laughs> left corner is Kara. <laughs> yeah, my dad, uh, dad carved that. <laughs> um, yeah, my, uh, my name is Kara Jade Myers. I'm Kiowa in Wichita and I am an actress living in LA. <laughs> Amazing. I look forward to learning more about your journey. And then Kelly, because she's amazing and has a bright lit up uh what is that bike tell us about that and yourself <laughs> hi everybody it's Negon Asuega Nidogenom Tuscarora Niwagi Wazodan hi everybody I'm Tuscarora Nation Turtle Clan I'm around upstate New York area originally but I am now in Los Angeles as well um the bike is uh there as a I actually do use it uh, but also this is a cool vibe, right? Like everything here, right? Just screams, is that real? Is that fake? And that's like, you know, if I can impress people with my background, that it's like makes the conversation easy, you know? So, yeah. Love it. And 
I guess, so, so further context, just for the way and reason I ask certain questions, I'm from the Clinkett and Haida Indian tribe of Alaska. I uh, pursued pageantry because I saw it as a platform to be able to showcase the vitality of American Indian and Alaska Native culture. And I continue to pursue that as my um, purpose, vision, and why through my efforts in media and television, most notably through Culture Story and Journey of the Freckled Indian. And so that is one reason I'm excited to talk to you all today is because I believe that we share that uh, passion for increasing representation of our people in media and TV. And um, Princess, because you have done such a great uh, job with Molly Denali, but some of your other projects that many of us may not even know about. Can you talk about how representation is a really important part of your work? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I just want to say, like, you know, despite the unprecedented times that we're living in, um, the, the great uncertainty of what we're facing with climate change, etc., um, I wake up pretty excited and feeling very grateful on a daily basis that our stories are finally getting out there um, and that our children are able to see them reflected in a positive light. Um, and I really just, I'm so inspired by all of you and the work that you're doing and countless other um, indigenous people that are really um, changing our value system and really like at the root of this, I believe is great systemic change that has to happen in the world. And we are playing a really big part of that. Um, so my passion and my desire, a lot of that does come um, from this yearning to have true narrative sovereignty. Um, I mean, I believe in tribal sovereignty. I believe in self sovereignty. I believe in this narrative sovereignty of us really taking hold of and telling stories from our own perspective. Um, so the, my work on Molly, you know, I, I, I definitely feel that I've had a kind of circuitous um, path in life. And I don't really like to use the term career because I feel like that's so embodied by like Western culture, I guess. But um, I feel just that life guide us, guides us in certain directions and how we choose to use like our energy is really, it's on us, right? And so sometimes in life I've been guided to work in the nonprofit world or I've been, you know, I had children, which I wasn't expecting to do. <laughs> and so those things, we just have to honor the things, you know, that happen in our life. And um, at this time, you know, I just, again, I just feel really have a lot of gratitude and I'm really excited about us being able to gain more narrative sovereignty and tell our own stories. Thank you, Princess. Uh, Tazba, how has re pursuing increased representation of American Indians and Alaska Natives influenced the work that you are pursuing? I think we had need your audio on. Sorry. Uh, can you ask me that one more time? I just want to make sure. Yeah. How so? Representation. I mean the. The one reason we're having a, this panel is because they want to increase representation of Native women's voices and, and also in, increase our uh, success in this industry. So the question is along the lines of representation. How has the pursuit of increased representation of Native Americans or Indigenous stories influenced your career path? Oh, I mean, it absolutely is a guiding light in the North Star of my career path. Um, I am most interested in telling indigenous female stories and inserting those perspectives into any show I'm a part of, whether it's native or non-native. And that's something that in all of the uh, general meetings that we're all familiar on this call with taking, that I never shy away from discussing that that's what I feel like I'm here to do and that's what I wanna do. And um, I, I don't see myself um, tiring of that only because there's such diversity in our stories across our nations that I don't think centering the indigenous female narrative is going to grow old. And I don't think that any of those narratives are going to have um, you know, overlap. So um, I would just say that it informs every career choice that I make and every project that I'm a part of. Um, so in a weird way, it just, it is my career is to um, increase representation and to, to stay um, looking at that North Star at all times. Love that must feel amazing to have that clarity about the purpose around your work, right? Oh, yeah, it's incredible. And it's, uh, 
you know, it, it was something that was able to come to life today on Reservation Dogs. It's like a, it's an example of having a, a Native woman director and star of a, of a television series, which is pretty incredible and something that like I really wish that I would have been able to see as a child. So for me, you know, today marks one of those, I think, like milestones of like, okay, I'm on the path and I'm sticking to it. Um, but yeah, it, it feels incredible. I mean, I plan to ask you about uh, how it feels to have your work actually debuted on Reservation Dogs. I plan to ask you that later on, but since you just referenced it, can you bring us into what that's like? Like, tell us more about that feeling, is that wow um, moment. It feels very surreal. <laughs> it feels good. It feels really good. It feels, um, you know, I, I watched last night with my family, my brothers and my dad and my partner and, um, just, you know, I had seen this cut a million times. And then to, when you see, as you all know on this call, that when you see your credits come up, that's like when it hits, you're like, oh, I did that. Like, and I, you know, I was like looking at my dad and my brothers and I'm the youngest of four children. And there's just kind of this moment where I'm like, guys, like, are you proud? Like I did something. Um, so no, it just, it feels, it feels really good. And it also feels, um, you know, there's so much work that goes into, uh, the process of having your work out there to begin with. You know, it's like so many, it's like almost a year ago now that that episode was first sort of being crafted. And now here we are a year later and the world gets to see it. So uh, it just feels incredible. Um, great, but also lots of hard work. Well, congratulations. We're all really proud of you. Thank you for that. That's nice to you. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, I saw you nodding a lot when uh, Tazo was like, you know, this was actually shot a year ago. Um, it's a lot of hard work. I mean, I think all of us here on the call know that this business is, we stick with it because it's, uh, it's our passion and our, our purpose and why is connected to it. But can you uh, give us some insight into why you were nodding? Like, give us some insight into why it's difficult and why it takes over a year for some of your work to get published. It is just about planting seeds. And I mean that in a long game way too. Like every single thing, every meeting you take, every person you work with, every project you're a part of, you plant a seed. And some of them grow and some of them don't. And then some of them all grow at the same time. And then the garden needs to be, you know, trimmed back a bit and you got to harvest like crazy. And that's kind of what it feels like, at least for me right now in my life. You know, I was so excited to see Tazva's episode come out and it was so thrilling. And I like right now you're sharing the stage. We're all sharing the stage in this moment with somebody who is breaking ground. We're all breaking ground. And that's what's so wild to step back and think of because this didn't happen overnight. This has been years, decades of hard work, decades of hard work of those who came before us who carved out paths so we could do this. Um, I'm just very grateful, but at the same time, we all have a million things going on that are going to eventually come out. And so I was just nodding because I was like, oh yeah, I wrote over 10 hours of television last year and only one hour has come out so far. And so I'm just sitting in anticipation, like, okay, when, a, when is that other stuff going to come out? So I'm excited to celebrate that when it does happen. <laughs> Can you tell us about any of that work? I mean, 10 hours of television or is that completely under wraps at the moment? Oh no, it's a bunch of shows I've worked on. Spirit Rangers on Netflix, uh, Tick and Seek on Cartoon Network. Um, oh gosh, I'm gonna start a uh, Chicken Squad on Disney Junior. Uh, I wrote the hour, uh, excuse me, I wrote the half hour episode of Miracle Workers that aired on season three recently, a few weeks back. Um, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. I'm missing a few shows. If anybody who worked with me on any of them is watching right now, I'm sorry, I still love you. There's just a lot and only so much in a finite time right now. Kelly, that is incredible. That is a lot of shows and momentum that you've built. I mean, are, are you having any of those like pinch me moments? You know, the real pinch me moments are coming from places that I wouldn't expect right now. I think the the pandemic has helped a lot of us and hindered a lot of us. It's been a big journey. And my pinch me moments are when I'm like going on walks and I'm being reminded of where I come from. That's where I am right now. Um, it's just really nice to feel, even though I'm super far away from home, just connected 
um, as much as I can be. And so that's where my pinch me moments are coming from. Even though all of this big, these big moments, you would think you would feel differently because this is what you build towards. But when you're there, it's kind of like a breath of, like it's like a relief, a sigh of relief. Cause it's like, great, finally we're getting the floor. We're finally getting there. So now I can step back and breathe and relax. <laughs> And when you say it, you're on your walks, you're remembering where you come from, it's because you realize that you've built from that dream from when you were growing up and now you're doing it. Is that what you mean? Yeah, um, I know my story is singular. Not every, we all have a different story. We all come from different places. We all have different relationships. Um, and for me, I really had to sacrifice a lot in order for me to try to do things that I felt like I was called to do. Um, and because of that, it led to me kind of moving out here where there was no track necessarily laid out, which was me navigating around like a chicken with its head cut off. Um, so for a few years, I think that I was just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall saying, okay, where, where do I go? What do I do? I feel confused. Um, but finally, once community really sunk in, once you kind of rise with your colleagues and those around you, it just you can start breathing, you can start bringing that community that you left to you again. And that's kind of what I mean. I, I think that feeling of just going after a vision and not knowing how it's going to all play out is a key aspect of being successful in this business. Would you agree with that, Kelly? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Kara, uh, Kelly referenced that this business is a lot about planting seeds, and we know that there's been some big seeds that have sprouted for you. So can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, I just uh, wrapped on Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, where I played Anna Brown, and it was honestly such an amazing experience. I loved being out in Oklahoma and like the casting crew was so amazing. But yeah, it was one of those things where I've been auditioning with this particular casting director for about 10 years since I've been here in LA. Um, and I, I didn't, oh, I haven't booked anything with her until this, <laughs> until this film, but like they kept calling me back in and they're always really sweet and they always believed in me. So, but it was a lot of rejection until I got to this. <laughs> Um, then what kept you pushing through? I mean, this business is a lot of rejection. So how did you make sure that that didn't dissuade you? And how did you stay on your path? Uh, I think mostly it's because I'm stubborn, but um, it was just one of those things where I'm like, I tried other things like, you, you know, you go into retail, you like, I'll be, you know, I don't know, something else. And then you start doing that and you're like, I hate my life. And the only thing that really made me happy was like uh, creating stories, acting, writing, um, just, you know, being a part of actually bringing stories to life. So I just kind of made the decision that I'm going to be in the entertainment industry no matter what you know, because it's just, I love storytelling. And of course, you, you know, Native Americans are so underrepresented that it's, it's it seems so important to me to keep going, you know, because if I give up, then it's like, that's just one less person that has, that's could be on TV that, you know, eventually, like I never saw, you know, Native Americans growing up. They're all like French tan people, you know? So um, <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, I love that right now we are having such, you know, like you said, a renaissance of um, Native American stories and, you know, women are so important in Native American culture. So I love that, you know, we're starting to come to the forefront. <laughs> I love when you said that one of the reasons that you're not giving up is because that would mean that there was one less Indigenous person pursuing their dream in the storytelling business and where we need to have more of our stories told. So what would you say to other people who have this as a dream, but find it, find it difficult? And what, what do you tell them to help them keep going? It's definitely hard. I think my big thing is find community. I found an amazing community with my acting studio and then also with Skins Fest. Like they, they've provided so many opportunities for me and they're always constantly, you know, calling me back and asking me to participate in things. And I absolutely love that because I've met some amazing people through this. And um, I did the writer's program with them and it honestly helped my acting so much. So for me, it's just keep pursuing, you know, it's so hard to, you'll get that rejection, but if you have the community that's where you see like, oh, you're not the only one getting rejected, all of us are, you know? <laughs> it helps and you know just to have fun with it and i think 
honestly, it's just that the community is important and just being stubborn and knowing that you can't give up because it, there is no like, oh, you go to college and then you get out of college and you're going right into, you know, WB studios and you're going to be an actor on Scorsese set kind of thing. I don't know that logic kind of sounded weird, but it's just, um, so I think for me, it's just, you know, keep being stubborn and find community and they'll help you. <laughs> well, I love the logic because you just referenced that um, you grow up and get to be on a Scorsese set and that literally just happened to you. So would that be your pinch me moment? <laughs> yeah, basically it was, uh, it was when I got the call from my manager and the casting director to say that I booked it. That's literally all I heard. We were on a zoom call for about 15 minutes, but I was just crying and I didn't hear anything else. I just heard that I booked it and I'm just like, <laughs> you know, just nodding and crying. <laughs> And that makes it all worth it. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Um, Princess, I saw you raise your hand. Um, you have the floor. Well, I just wanted to um, base, um, Kelly, you know, you mentioned the groundbreaking, the trail breaking that's happened and people that have been at this for a really long time. And I'll just mention that, you know, Ian Scroden shot one of my very first short films. Like Ian, it's so nice. I haven't seen Patty, Patricia for years, but you know, I just like remember my days in Los Angeles of like having to find that community. And it would, those were different times. There just wasn't the resources. And we were really just, you know, coming together where we could to support one another's projects. But I think that that is key. And I just want to shout out to Bird Running Water and Heather Ray and Sundance Program and Skins Fest and all of these um, people and programs and, you know, groups of organizations and communities that understood we needed to do capacity building. And that's really, you know, another thing that I'm really excited about. Um, I've been in the, in the weeds with um, planning an Alaska Native um, Filmmakers Lab focused on um, climate justice stories. And I just think that, you know, so often we have people from outside of our community coming in to want to tell our stories and we need to build the capacity because having that narrative sovereignty and having our indigenous lens, I think is so critical. Um, and so I'm just, I'm really, again, it's like community, like I can't tell you how many times, you know, even today where I'm faced with decisions or hard situations where you have to have your people that you can call up and be like, hey, you know, what do you think, gar garner their advice, those people that you that you really trust. I just think it's so key. Thank you. And Princess, the first time that I had the opportunity to speak with you, which was like last summer, you gave me some insight into how you built your career from your days in LA all the way up here to now the impactful work you're doing in Alaska. Um, can you walk us through that journey a bit? And then the second part, which I can remind you of, of the second part of the question is, you know, how have things changed in that period of time and what's the, and the positivity that's come with that change? I mean, it has been really circuitous. You know, I think that it was really challenging for me. My time in Los Angeles, like there was, um, you know, I really wanted to go out there more to write and direct, but I couldn't find writing jobs. I couldn't find directing jobs at that time. This is like early 2000s. And I could get some acting work, you know, here and there. And I did some work. I ended up um, really getting engaged with Native Voices at the Autry and becoming their production manager. And I was really grateful, you know, for that community. But um, I had a big life change and I moved back up to Alaska. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you're like leaving, you know, like you're leaving the industry. You're like, you're leaving the business. And and I didn't see it that way because I feel like I really don't believe in endings. Like there's just like, an infinite amount of beginnings. And um, I ended up, you know, doing work for my community and getting into more nonprofit work. Um, and then I, I guess like in that sense, like I haven't been like, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get an agent, I'm gonna get a manager and I'm gonna write, direct and act and do all these. It hasn't been laid out like that for me. I've really kind of like let myself be guided by whatever was of interest in my life at that time. And so when Molly of Denali then came back around, um, I was just like, this is it. Like this, I have to do this. Like I really wanted to um, be a part of that and still am. I still am writing for the show um, and on the advisory group. But 
what was this? I'm like, what was the second part of your question? I just totally yeah, forgot. I told you I'd remind just the positivity that's you. So what I heard from you was that when you were in LA pursuing your dream of acting and writing, that there weren't as many opportunities oh, yeah. that as time has passed, you've actually seen there to be an increase of opportunities and you've actually found opportunity independent of location. You found it in Alaska. And, and so I was just, uh, hoping you could paint the picture to the audience of giving them a, some hope that it's getting not necessarily easier to tell native stories, but there's more opportunity than ever. I was well, hoping you could do that. Certainly with the technology. And, you know, I will say one thing with animation, when everything else shut down, when production shut down, animation kept on going, um, at least for our production, you know, I'm Molly of Denali. And so I think that, and that's, you know, one thing, if, you know, anyone out there is like interested in animation, like that is like a totally that it, I'm really excited about animation. Like, obviously, like I'm, I can't wait for Spirit Rangers to come out. I actually did some voiceover on the show that I'm really excited about. Um, and we have somebody else, Alaska Native Carly Malamu also um, was writing for that show. Um, so it is, it's just like, you know, it's, it's super exciting. And um, Alyssa, you mentioned, mentioned like reaching out, like, you know, people shouldn't be shy to like reach out to, to other people that are in this business, especially, you know, Native women. Um, as much as possible, like I said, I believe in the capacity building and you never know who you might end up working with. Like, I mean, just to be in this like room with all of you is just like dreamy to me. So <laughs> I'm so happy that our, our paths crossed. Thank you, Princess. Uh, Tazba, can you talk to us about your journey to becoming a director of uh, one of the Res Dog shows? I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> How far back do we want to take the journey? <laughs> Honestly, like help us understand, bring us, bring us to present day, paraphrase as you will. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, oh my gosh, my journey directing started when I was 14. Um, I started out as a poet from a very young age and that's sort of what I see myself first and foremost as a performance poet. And then when I was about 14, um, my dad helped co-create this um, film and music academy called Akatubi Film and Music Academy that included people like Heather Ray, Kimberly Guerrero, Yvonne Russo, um, folks like that, of uh, Randy Redroad. And basically what they did is they came to my dad, it was Yvonne and Kimberly, who now has been in Rutherford Falls and been in Reservation Dogs. So it's like this full circle journey to having one of my earliest mentors as somebody that we can work with now. And Heather continues to be a mentor of mine to this day, but they basically... You know, came to my dad who uh, was working for um, a TANF program, which was rooted in sort of like preventative programs. And it was basically designed to keep a bunch of us res kids out of trouble during the summer. And so they created this program um, together that for like a month or two brought uh, native uh, actors, directors, producers, musicians together and created this film and music academy for our community and a few others in the Southern California area for tribes. And that was the first time that I was introduced to film as a medium. Like I had been writing and I knew I wanted to be a writer and you know my mother was a writer. So that's something I've always had around me. Um, but it was that that I made my first short film. And that first short film, um, went to festivals and I, you know, I was like 16 and I was like at a festival, like, like imaginative. And I could like perform my poetry live with like this, like angsty experimental poetic montage behind me. And I was like, this is rad. <laughs> um, and it was that film that also introduced me to people like Bird Running Water, um, who continues to be a close friend and mentor of mine to this day, which is also how then I um, became um, friends with Taika and Sterling like 15 years ago. And so when we talk about like, building networks and community and relationships like so much of what I get to do now is because of all of these people who were doing it for so long before me, who took me under their wing, who believed in me when I didn't always believe in myself, and who really um, have become family to me and, and really helped guide me along in this process. And so, you know, me being able to direct TV now 
start it at such a young age. And, you know, part of it is having a father who believed in arts. And, you know, unfortunately, it was a program that some of our other tribal leaders didn't think was important. And they didn't know, like, oh, who cares about film? Who cares about whatever? No one's going to, like, go to Hollywood. And um, that was something my dad was reflecting on last night over dinner. He was like, they said that it wasn't going to work. And look at you. I was like, that's what I'm saying. So I'm a huge believer in programs that do that. I mean, I think that's why um, programs like Skin Fest are so important as well, because it's like it does take somebody else who has gone through it before you to really nurture I think what a lot of us are born with and so um I mean I could go through the, the small beats of like how I got here but to me that's really where it comes from um is good relationship and community and I think just somebody believing in in art um in a, in a young person and, and validating that that's a viable career path. And um, because, you know, I related so much, Kara, when you were talking about how you go do these other things and you're just like, I don't want to do this because I worked for 12 years in the beauty care industry prior to switching full-time to writing and directing. Like I was like selling shampoo and like teaching other women how to like do scalp massages. And like, I was like teaching women how to like do business acumen and like all this it was just like because I was like okay well this is cool and this sustains me and I respected the job for keeping a roof over my head while I did art on the side but I did get to a point where I was like when I'm 80 am I gonna regret not doing this job and I was like no and then I struggled with like maybe going back to grad school I you guys I have studied for the LSAT the um the GMAT <laughs> the GMAT, like all of these, like I have studied for this and never finished. It's like, I'm not going to regret any of that. And I think I had a moment that Kara was sort of talking about too, where I was just like, man, the one thing I'll regret is like never trying to make it as like a, an artist. And so that's really like why I get to be doing what I'm doing now is like this uh, relentless of, uh, belief that people had in me that then I finally like had in myself as that, as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but yeah, that's all of us uh, were nodding our heads when <laughs> we were talking about studying for the LSAT or the GMAT. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, was... I have studied for all of those. So I, and it sounds like um, everyone else here has studied for at least some of those too. So then what was the, the crossover moment for you? Like, how did you, like, what opportunity was it or what realization yeah. or experience got, took you from? Yeah, you know, I'm going to do it on the side, art on the side, which many of us do, and it's fine to then having it be what you do full time to put the roof over your head. I've been doing performance poetry for a long, long time, and I had been creating um, work for other people and creating people's like marketing campaigns. And uh, so I was, I was, it was still active in, in doing, um, you know, film to a certain capacity, but I kind of had put myself in this bucket of like, I guess I'm just a poet, like, and I'm, that's what I'm going to do. But I had this opportunity come up uh, with at t Hello Labs, where they chose five up and coming writers and directors to make a short film that they would fund. And I was selected for that program. And basically what they did is they took these five uh, writer directors and they paired them with um, established folks in the industry. Uh, and so I was paired with Taika and they're like, oh, it's so exciting. You're really a Taika. I was like, I already know him. Like, of course it's exciting. Um, so, so they thought they were making this like, this like, you know, it was like he was an indigenous person. I was an indigenous person, but it actually worked out great because we'd been, you know, friends for so long and he'd been a mentor of mine for so long already. And so it was that um, program that I was able to make a short film called Your Name is in English. And when I made that film, I told myself that this was going to be my calling card that I took this very seriously and that if this was gonna be financed by somebody else that I was really going to make the most of this opportunity. And so I was still working a full-time job when I made that film. So I think there was weeks where I was probably working like 60, 70 hour weeks between the two, totally like losing my mind. But I had my sight set on like, I have to do an incredible job with this opportunity that I've been given and I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna give it my best. And so I made that short film and that short film was what got me representation. It also is the film that allowed me to quit my, um, my corporate beauty care job. And I basically had about four months of uh, worth of money to live off of. And I was like, well, if I quit my job and, and I devote the number of hours in the week that I have to other women for all these years to myself, and I look at what I'm good at and what gaps I need to fill, and I go fill those gaps in, like, where can I be in four months? Um, 
And it's six months when I was really running out of money. I finally got staffed for the first time on the resident alien. And that was really, truly the job that that changed uh, my life. And I owe Chris Sheridan, the showrunner, a lot to that and been working since. And it's it's been amazing. And, you know, it's somebody like Taika and Sterlin who did give me the opportunity to direct my first episode. So, so many of these things, like I said, started like 18 years ago now. Um, so it's a long, it's a long journey um, to get here, even though I know sometimes it looks overnight for many of us on social media. Yeah. I had to write down all of the auditions that I've ever done in an Excel spreadsheet to send it to an agent. And in four years, I've done over a hundred. And I I was like, wow. Um, So when I do book something, I feel like I've earned it. And so speaking of auditioning, um, Kara, you're a lot of people, I'm sure watching this, want to know about that journey to representation, from representation to auditioning to booking. Can you give us some insight into that process? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, <laughs> like Tasma said, it, like it, it looks like it's overnight when it's really not. But I've start, I've been acting since I was like 16, 18, around there. Um, and I'm 36 right now. So it's, it's definitely been a long time. And it's just, I, when I started out, I was terrible. And of course I wanted everything, you know, I remember auditioning for twilight and I was like, I've made it. And then I never actually made it, you know? (laughs) And, um, so it's just, it literally, it's been such a long process of just training myself. Like I'm still in training. I'm still doing what I need to be doing, but it's, it was definitely, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And I mean, there's definitely some people who get off the bus and they're like, Hey, I'm an actor. And you're like, okay, that's fine. Uh, was not that way for me, especially. And I feel like too, with like native, um, roles, like there's a lot of times where I'd read them and they feel like they're token native roles, you know, like they're just like, Oh, we need diversity here. And there's also been auditions where it's literally said, um, it doesn't matter that she's a prop to the male. Like it literally said in the audition, she's a prop to the male. So you're just like, I don't, I don't want to do that. So it's just, it's going through a lot of those crummy auditions and really crummy writing and really crummy stuff to get to, to where you start building your resume. And then finally, I mean, I, I, I've been with my manager for about two years now, a year, two years now, it started at the beginning of the pandemic and I have no idea. Time means nothing anymore. And so, um, I've just, and like, he's just been busting his butt, but I bust my butt too. Like I'm constantly in contact with him being like, what can I do to, for this audition? Or what do I need to do to get more auditions or what casting directors do I need to meet? Like, it's not something where I'm just like, well, you know, I I auditioned, I should get it. Like, no, it's like, I'm literally, I'm, I'm behind the scenes pushing. I'm on social media. I'm, you know, reaching out to casting directors. I'm talking to people. I'm like, it's, so it's just, it's a, it's a long process. And I think it's not something that you can be like, oh, you know, I kind of feel like acting. Let's try it. Cause if you're going to try it, you're going to get disappointed, you know? I mean, so I think, I think, like I said earlier, it was definitely, you know, like I, the lack of indigenous and native American especially women at representation has always bothered me. So it's, I, I push harder because of that. And I, in some aspects, um, it helps. And then in some aspects, I feel like I said, like I'm the token native, but I mean, for Scorsese, of course it helped because they needed native Americans. <laughs> so that was, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you for Kara. casting real natives. <laughs> Kara, do you think you're getting more opportunities uh, in like, in terms of roles that, aren't necessarily written for a Native American, but are just written for a woman. And then you happen to be Native American. Is that happening? Are we there yet? I've auditioned for a couple of things. Like the first role I had on TV was uh, This Is Us. And I played a cop. So, I mean, that was pretty, you know, it didn't necessarily have to be Native American. But uh, other than that, there's been... it. <sighs> the auditions seem kind of few and far between. It seems like I'm getting a lot of Native American auditions, which... I'm absolutely thrilled with. And the the amazing thing about it is the writing has gotten so much better. Cause before it was like, oh, she's in a headdress dancing around a fire. And you're like, no, no, I don't do that, you know? But then it's just like now, like we're actually getting Native, Native Americans in the writer's room and people like, 
are demanding uh, authenticity. Like they're demanding, no, we want native writers. We want, we want to see these authentic stories told by authentic people. So I think that's really helping to this push for actual diversity and, and actual um, authenticity. Thank you. Kelly, I saw you go like this. And so part of me just wants to let you say what you're going to say. And then I'll just ask some questions about to you as well. <laughs> I just wanted to chime in. I was her manager's assistant for almost two years. Whoa, small world. Got on. So like when she was just talking about like, it's a long game, it's a long game. Like I totally was like, yes, it is. Because like I snuck in, you know, I learned what I could under his belt. And it's just, it's just really wonderful how it all intersects. You know, you don't see those tracks being laid out but it's it's just it brought me joy when she talked about it so i just wanted to say that that's amazing what a what a cool crossover um i hope i, I bet there's it, there will increasingly be crossovers in this zoom room in terms of our careers it's bound to happen uh kelly i mean you are one of the reasons there's better writing in <laughs> Um, for Native actors to uh, be able to bring to life. Can, can you talk about the experience of being a Native writer in a writer's room? Can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, you know, I everyone here has a different story as to how they started sort of expressing themselves creatively or finding that one medium that they really wanted to refine to become their craft. Um, for me, I have deep expression on many levels. There's a lot of things that speak to me creatively. Um, and first and foremost, that was dance and musical theater. Um, the stage is always a place that I could exercise this sort of, um, I don't know, this like powerful calling, this creative engine, the spirit that guides me. Um, and then I started finding the words a little bit later when I was seven or eight, um, ironically in lyric writing and kind of poetry, not really poetry, Taz is probably way better than I am, but um, I started in lyrics and in script writing um, for the stage. And then I eventually transitioned realizing that you could actually do this as a profession. And my craft for me is my craft. And so at a young age, when I started writing television and film, it really actually came from a place where I was just writing I guess you could call it like accidental spec scripts or fan fiction. Um, there were so many shows I loved and I just wanted to be able to sink into the characters and write their voices um, and write all these theories I had and get them out on the paper and like play with these people kind of almost like all the dolls I played with growing up because I had no friends. So I played with Barbie dolls. So I was very, very old. The ones that my cousins all gave me. Um, played with them until they were like, you know, falling apart. And um, for me, I started using words and scripts to do that at a very young age. Um, once that transitioned into screenplays and script writing, you know, I just wanted to keep getting as, like, I just wanted to be the best I could be. Um, there was a part of me when I first moved out here a little over 10 years ago, that there was really no space for someone like me to exist, except for someone named Sierra, who we all know, who when I first moved out here, I was like her, how do I meet her? Like I, like I just was like laser focused on the chance to get to meet this one woman who had carved out a space. Um, but in the interim, I thought to myself, I'm gonna master the craft. So I'm gonna mimic every voice I see. I'm gonna be able to mimic white people, brown people. Like you have to just go in and you have to mimic whatever the showrunner wants because that way, if I get staffed on any show, I'm there and I can do the voice. I can present, I can write any story, not because I am native. So even if I'm there and I'm working for somebody else's voice and vision, I still insert my voice. I still insert my perspective and my philosophy while we're breaking story, while we're talking about character. And I think that's what sometimes people, and I love that Kara just brought up the word authenticity. I had recently just ruminated on the word and what that means. Because outside of us and our communities, a lot of people think they understand what an authentic native is or an authentic native story is. We're all authentically native, every single one of us. And everything we create is authentically native because we're inserted into it just by, just organically. Um, so that is something that I would just recommend, like write, create, generate, because everything you do is an extension of you. And that, and that's power. That's power to our voices, us as collective community and us hopefully getting the floor more and more in every corner, not just in TV film. 
I'm, I'm reflecting. It's, it's so beautifully put the way that you said, just by being in the writer's room, just by being in the, uh, in the audition room, just by existing in this industry, we are being, bringing a native perspective just by being ourselves. And so I just wanted to repeat that because that was just so lovely the way you put that. So thank you for bringing that to the conversation. Um, uh, princess, I feel like this speaks to you really well. I, in your, in your activism, in the, in the work you do with writing and producing, you are a big advocate of making sure there are native people, whether it's behind the, the camera or just in the room or um, contributing. Can you uh, tell us some of the ways that you are making that happen in greater frequency through your work? Well, I feel like it's critical. I think there's nothing more lonely than being the only native person in the room. I want to create with other native people. I want to be like, you know, on Molly, we were able to have um, Sydney Isaacs join us, who's a graduate of II Cinematic Arts. And, you know, all the time, like I'd be able to look at, you know, Sydney and like be able to have that camaraderie. And like, you know, if something came up in a meeting, we could kind of like, I roll. <laughs> um, there's a lot of education that happens on the show. But in any case, um, I think it's like critical. And again, like the capacity building, um, you know, even for myself, um, just recently, I became a storytelling fellow. It was last year um, through an organization that um, called Nia Taro and Tracy Rector. I don't know if you all know Tracy Rector, who I am so constantly in awe of and inspired by, and she's really such a, one of these people that is a nurturer. And I just like aspire to be like her because she's always like looking to bring people into the fold. Um, I just had one of the most beautiful and amazing experiences doing a short film um, it called, it's through a program they run called the Reciprocity Project. And the reason why it was so special to me is because I got to do it in my Gwich'in language and I did it with community members. Like I reached out to another community member and I was like, can you do this? You know, do, would you work on this film with me? And she was like, me? And I was just like, yeah, you. Her name is Alicia Carlson and she's lovely. And we just, it was such a um, spiritual venture for us. I mean, from the very beginning, like we reached out to, our traditional leader, Trimble Gilbert, to get his blessings and just had this whole conversation with him. And it just felt so embodied by our values and really to, to um, use our language and to kind of highlight our connection. Um, I come from a, a very heavily document, documented community. Um, so there's all types of media and documentaries about the Gwich'in Nation um, because we have fought um, to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from oil development for years. So to work on something, so even though it's just so humble, like a five minute film, um, but to do it in our language and to try to really show from the inside out, like our spiritual connection to the Batsai, to the caribou was so empowering you know, and meaningful and to do it with community. And so I think that any opportunity, like Tazba, you said, you know, you took that opportunity to do that short film and you're like, I'm gonna make this count. And I saw that short film and it was, it's so beautiful. I love that short film so much. And it spoke to me, like, I was like, yes. Like I've had that conversation. I've been in that, that ride so many times having that conversation. And so I just think that, you know, we'll find the ways, like there's always ways to bring people into the fold. And, um, and like others have mentioned here, there are those times when you have your self doubt that you feel insecure. And there's always that person that's just like, you got this, like, you know, you are talented and your story is unique and beautiful. And we all have that perspective to bring, whether it is through bringing a character to life, you know, with acting or, you know, writing a story or directing, you know, I, I think we as indigenous people take the hierarchy out of it. And we really come as a collective because it is about our collective well-being, right? So. That was beautifully put. And it's a reminder that we have to continue on the path, even when it gets hard. Uh, because we need to make sure that our dreams happen because it's for the betterment of our entire community. And that's one reason why we do this work is so that we can shine a positive light in our community and tell our own stories from 
from our own point of view. And along that um, line of thought, we have a question from the audience. We have Renee Watchman who um, has a question that is, do any of you have projects set in the contemporary times, the future or the future where your indigenous languages are prominent? Uh, so thank you, Renee, for the question. Does anyone, if can one of you raise or someone raise your hand if you want to take that question? Anyone? So it doesn't look like we have anyone working on a project. Oh, wait, Princess that looks like- That we can talk about. That we can talk about. Okay. That we can talk about. So we have a super top secret project that Kelly's working on that is in your indigenous language or a indigenous language. Can we know that? It's um, indigenous futurism. So that I'll just leave it at that. That's, that's cool. Okay. Already excited. And Princess, you raised your that, hand. That is super. I, I'm like, I want to hear about that, Kelly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, well, the project that I just mentioned. So it's, right. it's only, you know, five minutes, but it's entirely in the Gwich'in language. And I, I do have another project that I can't speak about that will also be entirely in the Gwich'in language. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I mean, I learned so much from from studying our own language and our own perspective. And it just, it blows me away because they're so, so incredibly beautiful and nuanced and full of metaphor and so many things that you don't see in the English language. So I, I'm really excited about it. Right, because there's descriptors in our language that is just for that place. Our language is so tied to place, which is amazing part of it. It's very descriptive. Uh, we have a question from a lot, uh, which is probably someone making fun of us a little bit, or maybe not. <laughs> a lot says, what stories do you want to see about Native people that have not been seen on the screen yet? It's a good question. Okay, Kelly? I want to see us in Bridgerton. We should be in Bridgerton. I want to see Natives in Bridgerton. Um, Kara, do you want to be in Bridgerton? <laughs> I don't know. They got rid of that Jean Paul guy who's really hot. So, <laughs> oh, I don't even want to watch it then. <laughs> I know, right? They got rid of him the second season. I was like, mm, yeah, no, I'll be in Bridgerton. I'll put on some fancy Victorian thing. <laughs> I mean, me too, but I'm less inclined now that I know. <laughs> Jean I know. Got oh, well. Sorry, <laughs> Jean. Um, <laughs> we're just appreciating your aesthetic. Okay. Um, anyone else want to take that um, question? Any, what stories do you want to see about Native people that have not yet been on screen? I feel like Tazva, you'd have a good answer to this. Well, I do, but I can't talk about it because I'm making it. <laughs> I'll just say uh, I would like a show about a contemporary female woman living in a city like LA or New York and just as living her life. Oh my gosh, the log line. Like, honestly, I just want like, I just want us to have like sex in the cities or like shows that are just about like us being women in the world in 2021. Like I want us to get ghosted sometimes. Like I want us to like have to deal with like dating. Like I want us to like have a job at the mall. Like I just like, I, I you know, I, I'm from the res. Like I'll always be, but like I've lived my adult life in cities and I just, I don't know. So for some reason, I think we get put into these things where we have to like, like be what people think native people are and we are those things but we're also a lot of other things so like i just would be excited to see something where we just get to be the people we are in this call awesome native joy um, that's what i want to see is just native joy because it's always tragedy it seems like so really? I'm joy. let's do some upbeat happy things we're funny people music oh you know go ahead I'm about uh, everybody of what I told my family that I want to do I was like I want to uh write and direct um a native lifetime movie about like Christmas on the press <laughs> it's not your cousin it's not your cousin I'm just like I just want to like because I have this aunt back home her aunt and my aunt Joan who like when you go to her house in Christmas it's like decked down Christmas she got the Christmas sweater like more presents you can ever see and I'm just like I just want to tell that story I just want to tell like these like very specific stories of people you don't see and I think we all have an aunt Joan but I'm just like I just want to like is that, is that where I'm from where there's 14 to 16 feet of snow or where princesses yeah. from <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, the family dynamics that would be in that show would just be unparalleled. Uh, Kara, what would be your dream role? A native or non-native role, meaning, because you can play either. That's what, it's kind of the question earlier. <laughs> right? I mean, honestly, like, I mean, I know Marvel's a big thing right now. So a native superhero, that would be amazing. I mean, I've kind of already played my dream role, but like, you know, from here on out, you know, let's go up. <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> Um, and then I, in the chat, a lot is my auntie or is Auntie Angie. I'm so, sorry, I did not know that. Just want to give you a little shout out. Um, and that is, oh, oh, my my ex's aunt from Long Beach, California. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate that. Thank you, Auntie Angie. <laughs> um, just since I just referenced dating and so did you, I feel like there could be take it or leave it. I, I did go on a Bumble date and a man, um, a white guy tried to get me to explain to him why Coachella um, headdresses are not okay. And just like, wouldn't let it go the entire um, coffee date. And I think there's some humor there. So um, we did not go on a second date. We'll just leave it at that. But anyways, um, really quickly, I want to see Kelly's indigenous futurism like I that is like definitely something I want to see and also like I just love to see anything like sci-fi or futuristic that isn't like apocalyptic like I want to see this radical different world that we just we can't yet quite grasp you know that's positive for like our kids you know because I feel like we're inundated with the apocalypse type of stuff and it would be so nice to see something just so it could be a comedy too just saying. Okay. I love it. That's fun. There's so many good stories to be told and I'm excited to see what, what all of you guys create. Um, we have a question from Maritza Lewis. Um, how much do you feel it helps having other indigenous creatives on your projects in media? You are often the only one. I feel like princess, you spoke to this a little bit and then they followed it up with how impactful is it to have shows like reservation falls, Rutherford falls, Molly of Denali, spirit rangers, um, how impactful is it to have more Indigenous creatives on board when you're making an Indigenous specific show? So those kind of go together. So um, Kelly, because you worked on Spirit Rangers, can you uh, answer this question that I'll put in short again? How important is it to have other Indigenous collaborators in a room like Spirit Rangers in the writer room? It, it lifts a veil. Like there's this whole thing you don't have to talk about. There's this whole thing you don't have to speak to because you can just be I mean you want to be surrounded by your by your fellow like natives because there's just the context is there and the great thing is too is like I have yet to be in a room just full of people from upstate like a bunch of people from the Haudenosaunee like I still I don't have that yet but I get to speak with other natives from other tribes and we all have different ways we're all learning from each other but but there is a unspoken understanding because we collectively have experienced a lot of the same stuff so it just makes it easy it's like it's like paddling down like the chillest stream in the world instead of going through like one during a turbulent storm that's the only way I can describe it yeah um and Kara have you gotten to collaborate with other indigenous actors has that made the experience better for you or what's that been like Oh yeah, no, it's been amazing. Cause like, it's not even just like actors. Like I know native directors, cinematographers, writers, and you know, it's just, it's amazing because like, like Kelly said, there is like a certain, I guess, unspoken, your veil is lifted because then you don't have to talk about certain things. Like I know that like, even on the set of Scorsese, like we would sit there and, um, a lot of the heads of the departments were white people who didn't quite, you know, weren't as familiar with native uh, traditions. So, you know, when we had a funeral, they were trying to put our hair up and put hats on us and stuff. And we were like, no, we wear our hair down. Like this is, you know, and they very respectfully were like, okay, you know, because I, I find a lot of times when you're one of the few natives, then you're constantly having to be the advocate and the teacher and you have to be the, uh, the, it's not counselor. What is it? I'm trying consultant. That's the word I'm looking for. So like, you're constantly doing, you're kind of wearing multiple hats. And like, if they have a native American question, they come to you. And, and sometimes it's hard because like I'm Kiowa in Wichita, I played in Osage, which, you know, they're very, very close, you know, they're, we're in the same state, but it's they're completely different 
you know, cultures. So for me, it's like, I, you know, you can't ask me questions about Osage. I can be like, well, traditionally, this is how it is, but then they have to go and actually talk to Osage people, which is, you know, which they were very, very good about hiring Osage behind the scenes, in front of the camera, consultants, like everything, like every step. So that really helped. But it definitely, I love working with other natives because there is just like a certain, like you can trust that what they're writing or what they're doing or what they're saying is authentic versus like someone just being like, oh, and now she wears a headdress because it's a ceremony. And you're like, no, 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 I don't <laughs> kind of thing. Oh, Kara, there's a question uh, from Patricia Reed that kind of goes along the lines of what you just referenced and th that any issues, well, she says writing about other tribes other than your own, but you were talking about uh, how you are from one tribe, but you're playing a tribal member from another um, community. So I'll yeah. rephrase the question, any issues acting as a, from, um, <laughs> acting from another you know, tribe? <laughs> I think my, I mean, like, it's just, it's just being respectful, you know what I'm saying? Cause like it with writing and acting, like you want to get the story right. And you want to be respectful to that culture and that tribe. And for me, I think the hardest thing was the language. Like uh, there, you guys were earlier talking about like, oh, do you have native language? Like we have a native language is just set in the 1920s. So it wasn't future, <laughs> but I mean, that was probably the hardest part for me was the the language. But I mean, honestly, the amazing thing about the film that I was on was that we actually shot on the Osage territory where these murders actually happened. So everyone that we ran across to or ran across were so open and telling us their story and talking about their culture and talking about how they knew the sisters and how they knew, you know, like or their their family, how their family was affected by the reign of terror. So it's it's, you know, I forgot the question and I forgot where I was going, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> well, I mean, wait, the, go ahead. From the writing perspective, if you, if you yeah, like. Thank you, Taz. Um, I appreciate that. Because I've been in um, three rooms now with Native, Native characters, and um, none of them have been my tribes. Um, and so what we have found to work really well is that so in some of these situations, like I was the only native writer in a room. In another situation, I was one of five and there was a native writer from the tribe, well, from a tribe that it was sort of related to. And then of course in reservation dogs, like Sterling's where from he's from. So like, the, like that's his story that we're supporting. But in the, in the case where I was the only native writer um, on a show, what I had the showrunner do, and I think this is where like writers are super important in rooms when you're telling native stories because you do have a lot of power on how things come out. Um, it's very hard to change once change once you're on set and you've hired people and you're rolling. It's it's so I do think that writers have a lot of responsibility to make sure things get done the right way from the jump. So one of the things we did on that show was that geographically where that show was set, it made sense for it to be a specific tribe. So it didn't make sense to make it my tribe because geographically that didn't make sense. And to me, I feel like it's really important that if you're gonna tell a story that you're including the people that are from that area, not just like randomly choosing like Navajos in the Pacific Northwest. Like it, it's just when you know that there's tribes there. So because of that, because I felt like it was really important that we do the tribe that is where this fictitious town is in the show, I, you know, I can only go so far in shaping these native characters um, based on what we have in similarities from being from the res and all of that. But when it came to like culturally specific things, I'm not from that tribe. And so what I what I had our showrunner do is hire a cultural consultant specifically from that tribe. And it was um, a cultural consultant who was also an elder. And so what this allowed us to do is when we came, um, when we had storylines that naturally led us towards a character having to do something that would be cultural or, um, you know, more spiritual, I would reach out to our cultural consultant and we would talk together and work really closely to say, okay, what would so-and-so do if this happened to her in real life, like back home? And he'd say, oh, well, you would have to... Um, I don't know, let's say there was a death and they say, we have to burn the clothing. Okay, great. Because my, not all of my tribes do that, but it's good for me to honor that this tribe does it. But it's working with a community, in my opinion, I think it's really important to work with a consultant from the community that you're writing about. I think that bringing in cultural consultants that are sort of um, from different places, while I think they're well-intended, I think that that still allows for a little bit of um, kind of, 
we're still not hitting the mark if you're if you're having um, a, a person from a different tribe consult on a different tribal nation and and their community and their practices. So my sort of rule of thumb that we've stuck with with all of these shows is like making sure that if we're not from that tribe and we're trying to honor geographically where something takes place, then we need to have writers from that place or we need to have a consultant who's really from that place and really combining those two forces together. Um, so I think that, you know, is, is it the dream to be able to have like a thousand native writers that represent every single nation? Yes, and I hope we get there someday. And right now we're in the phase where we're doing the best that we can with the writers that we have. But I found that that's one way where we feel like we can still do right by um, the tribes that we're writing into shows. And I'll just chime in because a lot of what yes, <laughs> thank yes, you. I, I just want to chime in because a lot of what Tasba, you know, what you're talking about, um, we don't have this resource in the United States yet, but um, the Indigenous Film Office in Canada and Imaginative put out the Pathways and Protocols document, and I always, you know, tell people to take a look at that as a resource, and hopefully one day we will get to that place where we have something, um, I think we're working towards it <laughs> um, here in the US, but I think especially, I mean, even for us to reference is good, but especially in partnership and with all of these, I'm sure many of you are similar to me where like, a lot of non-Indigenous productions will like reach out and I'm always like, y'all need to like really look at this resource. <laughs> but Princess, what I thought you were going to talk about was the amazing team of consultants that I believe you're a part of and your mom is a part of from Molly of Denali. Can you talk about that? Well, I would just say for us, you know, we have, yeah, our amazing Alaska Native Advisory Group that when I was in the creative producer role on Molly, like we le just le lent, like I leaned on them so much and um, you know, I think it's really important for us, our stories, sometimes Molly travels to different villages. And so it was really critical that we reach out to somebody from that specific community to come on as a consultant and advisor at the scripting process. And a lot of times, you know, they would offer, they'd be, everyone's like so excited. Actually, one of my favorite Molly stories takes, takes place in Atka and um, Crystal Dushkin, who's from out there, helped us with that one. It's just like turned out like so sweet because she was so involved in the writing of it and even um, sending us um, reference photos. So. Oh, that's awesome. And up at Nolikatuck, I saw there was someone filming for not the animated part, but the like actual, what do you call those? It's a funny name. They're called interstitials. It's like the little live action video that lives in between the two animated um, 11 and a half minute stories. Yeah, the show is doing so much to teach about Alaska Native culture. It's amazing. Um, Kelly, you've been leaning in uh, forward in your chair. I felt like you had something to say of all of this conversation about, um, you know, writing and writing about with other Indigenous voices. Do you have something to contribute? I'm just thoroughly engaged. I'm like an audience member actively like, oh yeah, like, you know, cause we're sharing the floor, but like, we're all learning from each other too. I think, I think that's something that's exciting though, like to touch on is that like each one of our stories, each one of our voices are so unique cause we haven't had a platform. Like none of us, like any, like, so I'm just sitting and it's like, it's like food for the soul because I just, this, I live for these moments. So, um, uh, I hope you enjoy my my big, uh, you know, neurodivergent eyes as I'm, you know, engaged in everyone's discussions. Neurodivergent eyes. Can that end up in one of your scripts? That's a, that was a great word choice. I <laughs> love that. Um, so I got word in the chat that we have 20 more minutes only together in order to answer three more questions. So I just wanted to set expectations uh, for the audience, but also uh, for our panelists. So we know that we only have that much time together, but that's still a lot of time in order to have some great information be shared. So um, Alex Ago uh, just asked, is it possible? Oh, wait, no, Alex Ago is our, or our panelist. Sorry, um, is our organizer, excuse me, Alex. Um, Chandra, uh, I apologize, I might I mispronounce this, um, Ikugan um, Sazasfran um, says, is it possible to hold productions accountable to hiring Native people in creative lead roles, producers, writers, directors, production managers, if they're trying to tell Native stories? So accountability in this industry, anyone want to speak to that? Somebody? I, I can speak to that yeah. a little bit. We, um, I led a panel with the uh, some 
Indigenous um, and Afro-Indigenous voices uh, at the WGA. And we had to speak on this um, at length um, because a lot of this discussion in terms of like productions and executives, it's a very different section <laughs> of the industry. These are a lot of people making the calls. And very recently there was um, some sort of, you know, I, I, some sort of thing that went out that brought back all this data and information that said like majority of the people in power are still white males making the calls, calling the shots. So you can get through as a writer, you can get all the way to the top at that one executive who's still there, that's maybe a part of an old school Hollywood boys club. <laughs> um, they're still the ones who can say yes, no, or change this. I don't like that. I don't think that, I don't think that's right. And those are the ones right now who also pay everyone's bills and give everyone a livelihood. So we're still navigating that. And collectively, not just as native people, but as a large group of us, because we're the majority here, we're not actually the minority here, but the majority of us collectively as minorities, we're all pushing forward and slowly cracking into the, um, you know, this, this wall that is slowly tumbling down. Um, to give you a little bit of perspective on like how you have to navigate things with where you're at and with what you can do um, strategically, and then you lift others up, and then eventually, hopefully, yes, we can continue to build that out. For example, Reservation Dogs did it like wonderfully. So I just want to highlight how that show like hired native, like every corner. It's beautiful. Okay, then Tazba, do you want to <laughs> talk about how we hold productions accountable to hiring native people in creative lead roles? Yes, I think um, the showrunner has like everything to do with it um, because that is essentially the CEO of the production. And um, I have seen every showrunner that I've worked for push for this. And um, I think that they have to want to put native people in key places. And I think Reservation Dogs is a really beautiful example where, um, you know, there was no alternative in Sterling's mind. He was just like, we're gonna have an all native writers room. And FX was like, okay. He's like, we're gonna have all native directors. And FX was like, okay. He's like, we're gonna have like an all native lead cast. We're like, okay. He was like, and we're gonna hire as many native like key people that we can. So we had like native department heads, PAs, like all the way through as much as we could do. And um, so I think that like, once you're in a position like Sterling and Sierra are to, make those decisions, people will stick by you in doing them. I think it's a little bit more difficult uh, with um, non-native showrunners. And, and sometimes I don't even know if they're aware of, of, of what they're keeping down. Like, I think they think that they're doing a great job um, pulling people up and to some, and sometimes they are. Um, but I, I think in order to really move this and to change this, it takes more of us getting to showrunner positions to really be in charge. And when you're put in positions of hiring power, it really, really changes the dynamic of, of who you can hire. Um, so I think to answer your question, it is possible. Um, and I think that we have people paving that way right now, but I think it's gonna take us being in those positions of power to really truly like, put people in these major positions. I mean, I feel like we can still dig into that, but that was so like beautifully, like I feel like you put a bow tie on it. So let's let's let that lie. Good job. <laughs> um, now we have a question from Miranda Dew uh, from the Pawnee Nation. Um, she says she's very happy to be here listening to the panel today. She's uh, also because she's a USC SCA alum and an indigenous woman and she's proud of us and what are some of the things uh, her question is what are some of the things you wish you had learned earlier or had access to earlier let's and then she has a second question but let's just do that one first um Kara yeah honestly uh just the resources like Tesla was saying it's like we don't have enough native people in leadership positions in the industry. So I think it's just getting the training and getting, you know, getting people up in the higher, higher, um, oh my God, I can't even think, higher levels. <laughs> oh my goodness, pandemic brain. But yeah, I think honestly, it's uh, the resources would just be like training and understanding because there's, I mean, I didn't, there's so much I don't 
you don't you don't know what you don't know like I didn't know a lot about acting I don't know a lot about writing it and I'm kind of learning it it's taken me 10 years to like learn how to be on set how to do these things so it's just it, having the resources and training would definitely help <laughs> uh, Kelly what do you wish you would have learned earlier I think for me there's a lot of things <laughs> But most, uh, I'm just going to be honest, most importantly, your mental health. Hey, that comes first. I mean it like I really, I was in survival mode for a very long time. I didn't have a lot, everything you see behind me, I've collected over 10 years. I moved out here with one suitcase, a couple, I uh, saved up a thousand dollars from working eight jobs and had a bucket full of dreams and didn't know one single person in LA. Um, and that really put I put a lot on me mentally, <laughs> just trying to survive for four years, the first four years out here. Um, but your mental health and your happiness comes first. It will come. I just want to say breathe, be present. It, it will come and it will rise with you. You know, um, I think there's a lot of times for me, I struggled because I wanted to get into programs and I didn't get into them. Um, I was lucky enough that LA Skins, Skins Fest um, for their first television program, I did get in, but it was very, very new. And the beautiful thing that it gave me was all of these other native writers that we all rose together. And once I got them three, you know, it was three or four years into me being out here. Once I landed that, I finally was able to breathe. Um, just have patience. I it's that's hard when you're trying to put food on the table and when you're trying to survive and not like sleep in your car for another week, but have patience. <laughs> and even if you need to sleep in your car, guess what? LA's got great weather. You can sleep anywhere around here. It's great. It's wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> um, uh, Tazba, uh, anybody who's even watched gosh, even a, a trailer on Instagram knows that the Res Dogs centers around young indigenous people. And uh, given that there may be either parents or young up and coming, uh, you know, people who are aspiring to be in this industry on the, uh, watching us here today as we talk on this panel, uh, what would you say that, what would you say to young people that are coming up? Like how, what has it been like interacting with those young actors? Like what are some of the things that are top of mind for, for youth that are pursuing the business? Um, I, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not, it's not that, a question about yourself now. It's like, what is your experience? No, it's, um, you? Yeah. So my, the question is, what is the, sorry, talk, I've also like, been how are you that. mentoring these, oh, yeah. um, these kids, these youth, like, yeah. and, and therefore what advice would you give to either the parents who have youth wanting to pursue this yep. or if there are youth watching us today? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, I mean, I think that, um, in the, there's, there's different sort of, there's youth in different uh, mediums involved in this that I work with. So like there's the youth involved in acting, there's the, the, the younger folks who are wanting to get into writing and directing. And so I, I kind of have uh, very uh, unofficial mentorships going on with a few people. And, um, you know, each of their needs in these areas are a little bit different. But like when I think about writing, because that's the thing I feel most like I can offer them, um, is sort of demystifying the process of a lot of these things. Um, you know, the few writers that I work with, um, just because they reached out and wanted to say, hey, I want to do this, talk to me. I was like, yeah, let's get on Zoom. And so now these are these are people that I we have like an informal mentorship going on between us. But one of the things that I noticed with each of them that was sort of similar was like demystify, demystifying a script. Like, like to just learn that there's a story that you want to tell and there's a passion that you have to even want to do this but one of the things i wish that i learned that i'm trying to teach to uh youth now is i just wish somebody we would have demystified a script from like story area to outline to script and i can't tell you how many people who want to do this who are like i just don't know where to start from my script i'm just on page one and nobody has ever told them or helped them understand that like your pay you don't start a script from just like 
page one sentence. Like there's a, there's a brainstorming process. There's like carding it. There's like putting it into one document of, do I have a story? Then you're like outlining per scene. Then you're finally going and you're filling out dialogue. And I just wish that someone would have told me that because the reason I wish that is because I put off pursuing this so long because I would sit down to write a script. I'm like, I can't do this. Like, I just can't take this idea and make it this thing. And I understood acts. Hi. <laughs> Hi. You know, because people talk about acts and this and that. And I was like, okay, cool. I get it. But like, I just wish, so for, for people, whether you're going to act or direct or to write, really investigate the process because I promise you, it makes the whole thing seem easier. Like once you demystify that someone just brilliant just sat down and like wrote this thing in one set, in one sitting, like once you get past thinking that, you'll be so much better off to know that it's a long process, but there's actually a formula to all of these things. There's a formula to directing, there's a formula to writing. I'm not an actress, so I can't speak to that. But that's what I would say is just like, learn about the process so that the story and the passion that you have have a place to fall in an actual tangible thing. Otherwise you'll just stay here all day dreaming like me for like 30 years before I figured out how to demystify the process. That is so helpful. And Kara, is there, is there a process to acting? <laughs> I mean, there's definitely processes. I don't necessarily have one because I'm just, I kind of just read the script and try to figure out what the character needs. But I mean, there's definitely like Meisner and stuff like that. So, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not good at that. <laughs> well, I think there's a process there. Um, <laughs> And, well, I mean, okay. I Princess add Winter. one other thing. Okay, uh, there's a second part to that question. I just wanna throw something out there. Um, they asked, um, how can institutions like USC do more to support native stories and students? And I just wanted to say like, if USC does things like partnering with the Autry and just getting, getting on the ground and working with like local active, native storytelling actor, like generative hubs, um, the more those collaborations happen, the more, that, the more that support is happening, I think you're gonna see more and more of the stories being told. And I also wanna say, I went to Syracuse University and they have an amazing foundational program with ESF and the Onondaga. And I got taught by like four or five native professors. It changed completely like how I not just perceived my stories creatively, but how I saw law. I took Mohawk Akwesasane law classes. I took, um, uh, 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 with Robin Kimmer who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass, I got to take lessons underneath her and learn about our relationship to the woods. And it just, everything is all, it all is all a part of the same generative story. So native professors really should be a part of the discussion too. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say use our films, use our television episodes as curriculum, have critical conversations and dialogue around those films, because I, I see right now, like we're starting to fill this space and there is this really exciting, like, you know, critical dialogue happening. And we're just going to continue to see, I believe our stories expand and like enter this, this space that we've been left out of for a really long time. Thank you. So we have five minutes left and what the hour and a half went by so fast. I think this is an important question though from Brittany Woods Orison. How are we bringing in the intersectionalities of indigenous, um, different indigenous backgrounds? So Afro-Indigenous, Indigenous disabled, queer Indigenous, undocumented Indigenous relatives. I mean, mixed race Indigenous. Uh, yeah, big question. <laughs> Who wants to take that? Uh, Kelly? Yeah, I think that first and foremost, the people leading all of this is, should be Black Native women. That's just my personal uh, view because they are the keepers of like both infinite worlds. And I look to them <laughs> um, as guiding lights. So it's been my goal and my hope to fold them into every creative conversation that I have, every dialogue I possibly can have, as well as just Black women too. Um, and just having a conversation across the table. I am a, I am queer. Um, I'm two spirit. I'm bi. I'm, you know, I'm a few things. So, like, I am a part of that discussion too on queer indigenous topics. I have family across the board who are disabled. Like, I, we all exist. We are dynamic. There are things that we need to start telling the stories 
about, but we are just starting telling those stories. And that's what's so exciting and thrilling, but it's going to, it, we're getting there one step at a time, one conversation at a time, one show at a time, one, one story at a time. And I can only speak to myself, but I actively think about it almost every day and have since I was a young little girl, because when I was looking for a place to belong, it was really hard for me with certain family dynamics. You know, I leaned on my brothers and my sisters um, of different races. And so it's just, it's an important conversation for me. Thank you. Anyone else want to take that question? Taz yeah, up? just like, you know, partnering with people and like, you know, I there's the filmmakers lab that we're doing the intensive, like we're, you know, reaching out and partnering with some like really amazing artists and filmmakers um, in the community. Um, and then there's another special project that I'm looking forward to um, writing with somebody. I won't talk about it right now, but <laughs> just like, you know, continually like reaching out and looking for creative ways to like partner and bring people into the fold is really critical. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll add that to, to that too, by, say, by saying that, you know, I think the work that we're all doing helps to amplify the rest of those voices because I was asked recently, like, you know, our native storytellers having like a moment and it's like, no, like all we did just now is kick the door open and we're just gonna hold it open to flood all of these different diverse indigenous stories, you know? And I think active ways that we can amplify, which I'm super excited we're gonna do in Res Dog season two is bringing those voices into the writer's room. So we, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but sorry, Sterling, we've doubled the size of our writer's room up to 12 indigenous writers that include the communities that we're trying to amplify. So, you know, like Kelly said, we're just getting started and we're, 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 we're kind of like, I feel like native storytellers right now are like, especially TV. I feel like we're like baby giraffes that like this first round, we were like season one, we're like getting our seat. Like, we're like, we really going to let us do this. Like, okay. Like, can we stand? And then we stood and we killed it. And so we're like, all right, everybody come to the table because we know we can pull this off now and we know that we're viable and we know there's audiences. And so, um, I think that, you know, we're going to see really exciting intersectionality in the, the next year of television that's coming out for Native Stories. That's incredible. Okay, so in our final minutes, I'm going to go around and ask everyone to say, like, either a piece of advice or something they want to make sure that people know about them or their work. And so we're going to start with uh, Princess, because we started with you in the beginning. What is, what's, what's some advice or what's something you want the audience to leave with um, from your perspective or about your work? I would say get out on the land wherever you are. Get out on the land and communicate with your plant relatives, with our animal relatives. Communicate with the weather. Do what you can to ground yourself and try to restore the balance that we need in our lives. And Whenever I do this for myself, I am humbled and I'm reminded, you know, that this is a critical part about remaining a true human being. We have to remember what it means to humble ourselves and to remain human and to give thanks um, for this beautiful world, this earth. Um, so that's my advice. Thank you. And if people want to follow your work, where would they do, where they follow you on Instagram or on a website? I am the most horrible marketer, I a self marketer like ever. I don't even have representation, people. If you, oh, you can follow, you can follow um, Reciprocity Project right now, um, and that's my short film, which is going to be premiering. And I'm really, really um, proud of that short film, and that's going to be premiering in February. So, amazing! Thank you, Princess, for being here and for everything you shared. Um, Tazba, any closing advice, um, projects we should look out for, and then where do we follow your work? Yeah, I am, my advice is, you know, if you have that, that creative itch inside of you, follow it, you know, and, 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 um, okay, I guess I have two very tangible sound pieces of advice to, to do that. Um, one, whatever it is that you're drawn to doing, look at kind of like your skill sets, like what do you already know how to do in that thing? And then what don't you do? And then just start filling in those gaps, like always be learning, always like be be training or, or, or honing your craft. And then I think I forgot my second piece of advice. It was really good though. Well, if you remember it in a few minutes, we can come back to it. Um, do you remember where people can follow your work? 
Mm, I don't remember that either. <laughs> um, dang it, it was like hone your craft. And then, ah, oh, man, guys, it was probably gonna just change everybody's life too. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, Will you post your advice on your Instagram if you remember it later? I remember it. I was like, All right. <laughs> Yeah, if I remember it, I'm just gonna be like, shout out, here's my advice. Um, no, but honestly, just like, just really like hone your craft, believe in your craft. Um, Find yeah. community partners and people that believe in you, even when you experience self-doubt. I feel like that was something you said earlier and was really good. I did give that advice earlier. Although, yeah. dang it, this last piece. I don't know, guys, blame me if, you, if it doesn't work out that I couldn't give you that second piece. <laughs> Thank you, Tazba. It's fun following your journey. And Kara, can you give us some advice and then let us know where we can follow your amazing career? Yes, uh, I guess my advice is kind of like just a motto that I've always lived by. And it's, I'd rather try and fail than never to have tried at all. So it's just, I, like, like I said, like with acting, it was kind of one of those things where I'm gonna do it no matter what. So even if I keep failing at it, eventually I'll make it. <laughs> And then you can just follow me on Instagram. My name, if you can, I don't know if you can see the little name on the thing. I'm assuming you can, but just type that in and you'll find me. Kara Jade Myers, in case the audience can't see it. <laughs> I remembered it. Oh my gosh, Tazba, enlighten <laughs> us. <laughs> I would say the second piece is as you work on your craft, as you go out and you and you and you try things, you put yourself out of there, out there, you know when you get told no to fit for things, which people say in the industry get told no a lot, I think be interested in those no's, like investigate the no. Like, I know it's, it's, it's hard to not take it personal, but just like the no that hits you, just like pick it up and like look at it and understand where that no came from because it's sort of a gift to tell you uh, just something that, that, that you need to grow in or a different approach you need to take. But I would just say, like, as you go on this, like, try not to get discouraged by no's, rather get interested in them and investigate them um, because that's how you learn and that's how you grow and you just keep honing that craft. But if you don't know what you're missing, which you don't know what you're missing until you're told no, <laughs> then it's hard to know where to put your focus. So that's, that's that thing that I just remembered. That was beautiful. Thank you. Investigate your no. Okay. okay. And Kelly advice where do we follow you uh follow me at kelly lynn dang on twitter and instagram i'm having fun curating my instagram i got into makeup over the pandemic y'all and fashion and just generally trying to present myself as like a normal workable human being so have fun with that on the insta if you want but mostly my dialogues on twitter so follow me on twitter um but for the advice i would just say um go there's a lot of things happening right now the world is changing and shifting but if there's one thing that we are good at it is adapting and rolling with these punches <laughs> um and that is our strength and that is a gift so though there are a lot of things that you might see outwardly go inward because all the answers you're looking for are just sitting there inside of you and your heart and your soul and your spirit and your mind and it is there's so much that's going to come out from that and that bright inner light, that bright inner knowledge, that inner spirit is really what's going to keep you connected to everything around you. So just keep going because it's there for you, no matter what medium it's going to be or where your career or life or journey will take you. It's all okay. It's all meant to be. Um, and that's my, that's my carry the great piece. That's, that's my two cents. Thank you, Kelly. That's great advice. So now we're going to take a moment to, I think I take a photo together if we can all smile and okay. I will screenshot it and send it um, to Alex and Patricia and to you guys. Okay. Okay. We got our screenshot and I just want to say thank you everyone who tuned in. Thank you to USC school cinema um, thank you la uh, skins fest and thank you to all of you for being amazing panelists uh, i'm your host Alyssa london if you want to follow me i'm on um, instagram facebook and twitter at Alyssa k london and this has been the native american women in film and media uh, panel with usc and la skins fest hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot i had a great time asking questions and that is all for now goodness sheesh thank you thank you so much for having us
Thank you. Masicho, Kanishish. Kanishish.